Well, we're back for what I think is our last vodcast on the periodic table, chapter 6 in chemistry. Very important to note that the concepts I'm going to talk about now are not actually in your textbook, but are important for you to make sure you note on your yellow PowerPoint notes what these new trends are. So far, we've studied two difficult ones, relatively speaking, electronegativity and ionization energy. Well, the next concept, electron affinity, is kind of the opposite of ionization energy. Ionization energy measured how hard or easy it was for another element to take another element's electrons. And some elements are electron losers and some are electron grabbers. Well, this is about a way to measure the grabbiness that one atom has for another. So electron affinity shows how easy it is for an atom to gain electrons and become a negative anion. Those are two terms that you need to know. Anion, think negative, think against, anti, maybe that's how to remember it. Putting electrons on an atom adds negativity and makes it a minus charge. Losing electrons is losing negativity and the name of positive ions that form from the loss of an electron is cation. Now when you have a negative value for your electron affinity, basically what it's saying is, oh, thank God, chlorine says I had seven valence electrons, I really needed a seventh one, now I'm at a lower energy state. If, however, the adding of an electron to an atom is a positive electron affinity, that's probably much less likely to happen. It's kind of like you're forcing an electron to jump onto an atom. So let's just focus on this chart and take a look at the trends. When you see, and again, the eight representative groups, when you see negative values, that's telling you that energy got released when that atom picked up an electron. You should see the highest negative values over here in Roman numeral column 7 and 6a. That's because everyone in the oxygen group has six electrons and desperately wants to steal two. And everyone in column Roman numeral 7a has seven valence electrons and desperately needs one more. Why? The magic number for stability, again, of course, is eight. All of the noble gases except helium are noble because their outermost valence electron is a sum of the outermost S and P, as we did in our grouping elements activity in the last chapter, and that number, except for helium, is 8. So it makes more sense for elements close to neon or sulfur and chlorine close to argon to steal two or to steal one electron respectively, and in doing so, they release energy, and the release of energy puts them in a more stable state. Our new word was they become isoelectronic with the nearest noble gas. Fluorine doesn't turn into neon when it grabs an extra electron, but its electron configuration is just like that of neons when it steals one. And that's what the term isoelectronic means. So if you see any positive values in here, and if you want to know why those are positive, take AP Chem next year. It's not that big of a deal. You have to force an electron onto an atom if the value of their electron affinity is positive. So the more negative and bigger the number gets, the greater grabbiness they have for somebody else's electrons. So make sure you note your trends. As you go down a group, the electron affinity increases. Well, I'm not sure I would say because the atomic size increases. I'm not sure I would agree with that at all. But as I go from left to right, yes, atoms are smaller, and yes, their nuclear charge increases. That means more positive protons in the electron make a greater positive negative charge or positive charge that attracts opposites which are the negative charges. But I would probably say as a more stronger argument these elements have respectively five, six, or seven electrons and it's energetically easier for them to steal three, two, or one to get the stable octet of the nearest noble gas. I'm not sure I agree with this electron affinity trend. That's not a trend that I'm going to actually hold you responsible for, the why part. You do need to know the what. On that one, you don't necessarily need to know the why. 
So let's think of another way maybe to say that. Mm, I think I've got it. If I look at an atom at the bottom of the alkali metal, like cesium, cesium readily loses its um, outermost electron. And the flip side or opposite of that is that it doesn't really want to pick up any electrons. So that's why its electron affinity is a smaller negative value as I go down. That's probably a better way to think of it. Now I believe we already covered melting points, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time here. We learned from the video, cesium melts in my hand. So on the metallic side of the periodic table, melting points get lower. On the non-metal upper right corner, you can see we go from a gas of chlorine to a liquid of bromine to the solid iodine at room temperature. That means that the melting points are getting higher. So the trends sometimes on the periodic table are opposite between the nonmetal and the metallic sides. You don't need to learn any trend for going from left to right. So fill it in as you make, make sense for you. And I believe this is a rerun. I spoke on another vodcast, but I'll go ahead and cover it anyways. We get less metallic when we're at the top of a column and you get more metallic going down. So the way it works is if you have two elements in the same row together, who's ever farthest to the left is more metallic. If you have two elements in the same vertical column, whoever is lowest down is the most metallic. So the most metallic element of all that's not radioactive would be cesium, and the least metallic element of all would be fluorine, if we're going to go ahead and exclude the noble gases. But it doesn't really matter. They're all pretty much gases up in that corner. So what was that metallic character again? Shiny, malleable, um, ductile, conductible, all the things that we've learned about metallic character. Here's another way to show that. Now mostly, the way we use this concept is in learning how to write the correct formulas of compounds. And the general rule is that we write the symbol of the most metallic element first. For example, if you had carbon and oxygen bonded in carbon dioxide, I know carbon's not a metal. I know oxygen's not a metal. But since carbon is to the left of oxygen, it's technically more metallic. So we say CO2, carbon dioxide, not dioxygen carbide. We say the symbol of the element and write the symbol of the element first. That's more metallic. And I also believe I did this, but I'll go ahead and do another quick review. The most reactive metal is cesium at the bottom of its group. The most reactive nonmetal, that T rex <coughs> of the periodic table, is fluorine at the top of its group. So these trends, chemical reactivity increasing as we go down on the metals and chemical reactivity decreasing, we go from crazy to calm when we go to fluorine to iodine, that's uh, again an example of two trends that are opposite. Remember here's our metalloid staircase across this little section here and the nonmetals and the metals have opposite trends. That is it. We're done with our vodcast on chapter six, I believe it is, the periodic table. Make sure you're done with all of them by Friday. We're testing next Tuesday. I'll see you tomorrow.